to Chasing Epiphanies, where knowledge is power and the pursuit of wisdom is celebrated for its own sake. My name is Marco, and this is the review of If it weren't for my horse, I never would have gotten laid at age 11. Metaphorically speaking. Oh, uh, sorry, I mean a little hero. When I think of Dostoevsky, my first thought usually goes to gigantic, epic-sized volumes of classic literature. I was always intimidated of getting into his writings due to the dedication it would require. But by chance I happened to see his name printed on this book in my local library, finding that its story barely even filled 50 pages. So hey, let's get some Russian culture up in here. A Little Hero, as the title suggests, is about a young boy and his everyday adventures. It's in many ways a coming-of-age story told to us by a nameless protagonist, reminiscing about his time as a wee lad, taking the first steps from boyhood into manhood as he's starting to notice girls for the first time, or in this case women who are way older than him. He's been sent to spend time at a relative's house, who has gathered countless guests to splurge on having dinner parties and picnics, showing off their great wealth. It's a privilege to be a child at a fancy Russian dinner party, as he's often given attention from the women, who in their absolute boredom seem to love showering him with affection. It's also a curse to be a child at a fancy Russian dinner party, because these women will treat him as a plaything to tease, sometimes driving him to the verge of tears as they keep embarrassing him. We never learn the proper names of these dinner guests either, only our protagonist nicknames for them, like his blonde tormentor that's always laughing and living strong, going a bit further than she should in teasing him. Yet he can't help but develop a crush on this sadistic bully of a lady, as he's captivated by her beauty. The way she teases him is also part of what builds up frustration in our little hero. He's a timid child at the end of the day, but ends up having these sudden outbursts of courage in order to prove what he's made of. The blonde tormentor also has a close friend, Madame M, a tall and kind woman, yet submissive to a fault in how accommodating she is to everyone around her. A different reading of the book, however, might just indicate that Madame M and her kindness is just another facet of the kind of heroism that the book wishes to portray. Few men know the infinite patience of love, compassion and forgiveness that may be found in some women's hearts. Perfect treasures of sympathy, consolation and hope are laid up in these pure hearts, so often full of suffering of their own, for a heart which loves much, grieves much, though their wounds are carefully hidden from the curious eye, for deep sadness is most often mute and concealed. They are not dismayed by the depth of the wound, nor by its foulness and its stench. Anyone who comes to them is deserving of help. They are, as it were, born for heroism. And then there's Mr. M, a European man who considers himself above all others, and has no lack of highbrow ideas to share in order to put his genius on display. A man who has not accomplished anything of significance, nor is he trying to, yet you might still find him complaining about how there's just nothing for him to do. Or more likely, he simply refuses to do anything since he can't be bothered to do actual work. In spite of this rather condemning description that our narrator gives us of Mr. M, he doesn't really play an active role in the plot. More than anything, he's simply there to contextualize some of Madame M's behavior. It's never said outright, but everyone can tell that Madame M gets particularly tense and anxious whenever her husband is around. Our protagonist finds her crying on more than one occasion. In his uh, childish state, he doesn't really know how to react, and so he just does whatever she tells him to do, or tries to cheer her up in the most indirect of ways. If there's just one thing I'd criticize this book for, it's how unfocused it felt at times. Mr. M, like I said, gets an incredibly colorful description that puts him in the focus, yet he doesn't matter too much to the core plot. And our hero's interactions with the two female leads feel like two very separate mini-arcs within this already quite short story. For what it's worth though, these two mini-adventures he goes on, one involving a wild horse and the other a misplaced love letter, are still well told with simple yet effective prose. The underlying theme of stepping into adulthood can be seen both plainly stated in the text and also in the subtext in the form of some uh, subtle imagery like farmers working with their snake-like scythes, all while surrounded by blooming spring flowers that spruce the air with heavenly scents. A fruitful and fertile environment indeed. 
As for the subject matter of a young boy getting into these romantically charged situations with two older women, it's handled in a classy way, tiptoeing at a risky edge maybe, but ultimately keeping it cute and childish, in a way that feels more like a growing friendship. It's also helped by the fact that this story is being told to us as a fond childhood memory by the protagonist, who we can assume is older by now as he narrates the events to us. But that's not everything. Something extra remarkable about this story is also its conception. Dostoevsky wrote this while imprisoned, under suspicion of conspiring against the Tsardom of Russia. In reality, what happened was that he was invited to take part in some Friday meetings by contemporary socialist Mikhail Petrashevsky, so he and other intellectuals could gather and discuss the questions of their times. No clear political unity was to be found at this gathering, as a lot of them disagreed with each other on countless of points. At one particular meeting, however, Dostoevsky read out loud from an open letter from Belinsky to Gogol, a topical letter at the time, wherein Belinsky described the Russian Orthodox Church as a servant of despotism, flatterer of authority, and a persecutor of brotherhood among men, among other things. Despite openly declaring he didn't agree with the letter, after quoting it, Dostoevsky soon would be woken by a couple of men at his bedside, politely telling him to get up and come along with them. The solitary confinement that would break many a people, however, ended up helping Dostoevsky as he managed to fully dedicate himself to writing, in such a way that he overcame the oppressing loneliness. When I found myself in the fortress, I thought that this would be the end of me. I thought that I wouldn't hold out for three days. And then, I suddenly found calm. And what was I doing? I was writing a little hero. Read it, can you see any bitterness in it? Any torment? I had peaceful, lovely, good dreams. To sum up, if you've got some spare time to spend on a cute short story about tiny everyday acts of bravery and kindness, or if, like me, you want to get a taste of Dostoevsky before deciding if you want to check out his longer works, then a little hero can be a good starting point. And that does it for this review! And always remember, intelligence is sexy, so be the sexy you. Read a book.